Constitution, Article One, Necessary and Proper Clause, Common Interpretation by Gary Lawson and Neil S. Siegel. The Constitution enumerates a great many powers of Congress, ranging from seemingly minor powers such as the powers to regulate interstate or foreign commerce. The seemingly more minor powers, such as the power to establish post offices, the post roads, but there are many powers that most people today, or in 1788 when the Constitution was ratified, would expect Congress to exercise, that are not part of those enumerations. The Constitution assumes that there will be federal departments, offices, and officers. But no clause expressly gives Congress power to create them. Congress is given special power to punish counterfeiting and piracy, but、uh, there is no explicit general authorization to provide criminal or civil penalties for violating federal law. Several constitutional provisions giving Congress give Congress substantial authority. Or the nation's finances, but no clause discusses a national black national bank or federal corporations. These unspecified but undoubtedly congressional powers and many others emerge from the clause in the end of Article One, Section Eight, which gives Congress the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution. The other federal powers granted by the Constitution. This residual clause, called and various time the elastic clause, the sweeping clause, and from the 20th century onward, the necessary and the proper clause, is the constitutional source of the vast majority of federal laws. Virtually all of the laws establishing the machinery of government, as well as Substantive laws, ranging from anti-discrimination laws to labor laws, are enacted under the authority of the necessary and the proper clause. This clause this might be the single most important provision in the Constitution. In the first glance, and keep in mind that the first glances are not always last glances. Close analysis of the words of the necessary and the proper clause. Suggests three criteria for the federal law to be within its scope. Laws enacted pursuant to the clause must be a one necessary, b proper, and the three for carrying into execution some other federal power. Historically, most of the controversial controversy surrounding the meaning of the necessary and proper clause. Have we centered on the word "necessary"? In the 1790s, during the Washington administration, and、uh, again two decades later in the Supreme Court, attempts to create a national bank in order to aid the nation's finances generated three competing understandings of what kind of connection with another federal power makes a law necessary for implementing that power. Those understandings ranged from a strictly essential connection, without which the implemented grand power would be nugatory, Tom Jefferson, to an intermediate requirement for some obvious and precise affinity between the implemented power and the Im- implementing power, James Madison, and to a very loose requirement allowing any law. It might be considered to be conducive to executing the implemented power. Alexander Hamilton, McCulloch versus Maryland, 1819, the Supreme Court's most famous case, interpreted the necessary and the proper clause. The court sided with Hamilton, giving Congress very broad authority to determine what is necessary for implementing federal powers. Subsequent cases has been enlisted and generals to Congress of finding necessity whenever one can imagine a rational basis for connecting implementing means to legislative ends. 
Indeed, no congressional law has ever been held unconstitutional by the Supreme Court on the stated ground that it was not necessary to implement a federal power. Until quite recently, the word proper played no serious role in constitutional debates about the meaning of the clause. Indeed, a number of founding era figures, including such luminaries, Luminaries like as、uh, Patrick Henry, James Monroe, and、uh, Daniel Webster, saw that as the word "proper" was superfluous, superplusage, that、uh, added nothing to the word "necessary." In 1997, however, following some academic commentary that sought to give substance to the substance to the requirement of a Propriety. The Supreme Court held in Prince v. United States that federal law compelling state executive officials to implement federal gun re- restriction requirements was not proper because it did not respect the federal state boundaries that were part of the Constitution's background or structure. Some later cases extended and hold in to other matters involving federal state relations in. FIB v. Sibelius, 2012, a constitutional challenge to Obamacare, the federal health care law, the court sharply divided over whether a law could ever fail to be proper if it did not involve direct federal regulation of state governments or state officials. The subject is likely to be a point of contention in the future. There was also little action until recently regarding what it means for the law to be for carrying into execution another federal power. For a long time, the standard assumption has been that laws can carry federal powers into execution by making other laws grounded in those powers more effective. For example, the court assumed in Missouri v. Holland. 1920, then Congress could use the necessary and proper clause to carry into execution the treaty power by implementing and extending the substantive terms of a treaty. In recent years, however, three justices have followed the lead of certain legal scholars by arguing that carrying the treaty power into execution means providing funds for ambassadors, pens, the ink, and the travel to foreign nations. In other words, it means making it possible to negotiate, draft, and ratify a treaty rather than to make the treaty more effective once it is negotiated, drafted, and ratified. Again, this subject is likely to be a point of contention in the future. All of the foregoing, however, assumes. The right way to interpret the necessary and proper clause is to pick apart its individual words and give each key term an independent meaning. That is not the only way to interpret the clause. In that, instead, one might look at the clause as a single, undifferentiated provision and try to discern the range of、uh, laws that、uh, the clause would、uh, is holistically and.、Uh, per- Purposefully try to authorize. One such vision, reflecting one of our separate statements, sees the clause as codification of principles of agency law that allow agents to exercise certain defined powers that are incidental to the main objects of those documents that empower the agents. The situation reflecting another of our separate statements, we use the clause as a carrying forward ideas from a resolution adopted by the Constitutional Convention that will allow Congress to legislate in all cases for the general interests of the Union, and in those to which the states are separately incompetent. If the necessary and proper clause has a relatively broad scope. And the second vision and two century for case law has largely maintained. It provides constitutional authorization for much of the existing federal machinery. If it has a narrow scope, and the first vision and the small but vocal group of justices scholars maintains a great many federal laws, 
that have been taken for granted for a long time might be called into question. The correct interpretation, the necessary and proper clause, might just might be the single most important question of American constitutional law. Matters of debate. The necessary and the proper clause and the lawful agency by Gary Lawson. The necessary and the proper clause, which have been familiar to founding era people from their everyday lives, then as today people often designated agents to act on their behalf in various circumstances, ranging from selling goods overseas to managing farms to serving as gardens for minor children, the legal documents creating those agency relationships. Would expressly identify the main or principal powers to be exercised by the agents. Questions would naturally arise about whether the agents could exercise implied or incidental powers in carrying out their tasks. For example, could agents selling goods overseas agree to a sale on credit, or could they only accept the cash? Could someone charged with managing a farm listed to a third party? Or even sell the farm outright if an attractive offer came along. A legal document could try to specify some of those incidental powers, but to anticipate every circumstance would be both hopeless and expensive. The obvious solution was a general clause outlining the scope of the agent's incidental powers, informed by established customs, traditions, setting baselines for the. Instead of powers, agents in different contexts. The necessary and proper clause, which gives Congress power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution other federal powers, is precisely this kind of incidental powers clause. It was drafted by a committee for detail consisting of four practicing lawyers. Familiar with writing agency documents and businessmen familiar with applying them, the clause is the language which require incidental congressional power laws to be both necessary and proper in the conjunct in the conjunctive, with among the more restrictive or limited formulations for incidental powers available in the late 18th century. So it was more generous than the Articles of Confederation, which. Specifically, forbade any incidental powers by authorizing the exercise only of power expressly granted. Several important conclusions follow from the agency law origins and character of the necessary proper clause. First, the initial question for the law enacted on the clause is not whether the law is necessary, proper, or for carrying to execution other federal powers. The initial question is always whether the law represents exercise of a truly incidental power, or instead try to exercise a principal power that would need to be specifically enumerated. In private law contexts, such questions were often informed by customs. But by the late 18th century, for example, the power to manage a farm presumptively included. As an instance, the power to lease a farm, but it did not presumptively include the power to sell the farm. If you wanted to let to let agent to sell the farm, you needed to spell that out as a principal power in the document. Accordingly, under the necessary and proper clause, one might always ask whether Congress is trying to exercise, in the words of Chief Justice John Marshall, from. McCulloch v. Maryland, 1819, a great substantive and independent power, which cannot be implied as incidental to other powers, or is instead employing means no less usual, not of high higher dignity, not more requiring a particular specification than other means. Is it true with almost any plausible constitutional principle applying the distinction between principal and incidental constitutional powers is not always easy.
is a closed question as a matter of original meaning. For example, whether Congress can incorporate the National Bank as incident to its enumerated financial powers, but some questions are easy. Congress can clearly create federal offices and impose penalties for violation of federal law as innocent incidents to its principal powers. Congress says clearly cannot use a necessary and proper clause to force people to purchase products from others, as Congress did with individual mandate in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, Act Obamacare. The power to force people to transact with others is a great substantive and independent power, which is why the Constitution enumerates it as a principal power. In the limited context, by granting Congress express authority to lay and collect taxes, similarly, the power to hold someone over in prison after the sentence has run and ensued in United States versus Comstock, 2010, is patently a principle rather than incidental power. The power to regulate interstate commerce, which grounds more much of the modern federal regulatory regime, may also qualify as a principal power. If so, no amount of necessity, convenience, or helpfulness can turn a principal power into an. Incident. Second, even a power that is incidental to a principal power must be necessary and proper for carrying into execution some other federal power. In the late 18th century, incidental powers were necessary when they were neither either indispensable, indispensable, customary, or, in the words of the great 18th century legal scholar. William Blackstone, so annexed to and so necessary to the well-being of the principal power, that they shall accompany the principal power wherever it rests. The Supreme Court's Hamiltonian understanding of necessary as convenient or rational related to is a pretty plainly wrong. James Madison views that such laws must have an obvious precise affinity. With the principal power, the implemented much better captures the founding era conception of necessity in this context. Third, laws under the necessary and proper clause must be proper. That means, in essence, in essence, they must conform to the standard duties of agents, what today we call fiduciary duties, which require personal exercise of power and the conf. Conformance with the duty of care, loyalty, and impartiality. The necessary and proper clause this reflects a principle of non-delegation. It even grounds something resembling what today we call principles of equal protection, impartiality, and the substantive due process duties of care. The other side will be the necessary and the proper clause and the collective action principle by Neil S. Siegel. Article One, Section Eight is not a collection of unrelated legislative powers. The clauses were initially drafted, drafted by the Committee of Detail, which has been. Is drafted by the Philadelphia Convention of 1787. The Congress would have the authority to legislate in all cases for the general interest of the Union, and also in those cases to which the states are separately incompetent. The language is as a, a background or structural principle of constitutional interpretation. The collective action principle that it can help in constructing. The clause is section eight. The collective action principle reflects the primary reason why the framers created a national government with substantially more authority than it is possessed under the article Articles of Confederation. You can see、uh, Robert D. Cooter 
and uh, neo as Siegel Collective Action Federalism, a general theory of Article 1, Section 8. The framers wrote Section 8 to address serious collective action problems facing the states during the 1780s. They especially wanted to protect the states from one another in the commercial sphere and from European powers in the military sphere. States act individually when they needed to act collectively, discriminating against interstate commerce and the free riding on the contributions of other states to the national treasury and military. Moreover, Congress lacked the power to address those pro problems. Section 8 gave Congress the power including the authority to tax, regulate interstate commerce, raise and support the military, and make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the, in the government of the United States, any department or officer thereof. That last power is a necessary, necessary and a proper clause. The ones of Section 8's vision of effective collective action in three ways. First, the clause underscores that the Congress possesses authority not just to directly solve collective action problems through use of its enumerated powers, but also to pass laws that do not themselves solve such problems, but are convenient or useful to carry into execution congressional powers that do. For example, regardless of whether an individual mandate to purchase health insurance itself solve collective action problems, and it was in the scope of commerce clause, such a mandate is convenient for carrying into execution, that is, making more effective clearly valid commerce clause regulations of health insurance companies, such as the prohibition on denying courage to people with pre existing conditions. Such pre uh, prohibition solves collect action problems by, for instance, de-incentivizing insurance companies from moving to states that allow them to deny courage to people with pre-existing conditions. Without federal intervention, a destructive race to the bottom might ensue in which even states that prefer to protect residents with pre-existing conditions nonetheless allow insurers to deny them courage. A requirement to purchase insurance is convenient for carrying this violent commerce clause regulation into effect because it combats the perverse incentive people would otherwise have to wait until they become sick to purchase insurance. So they would have such an incentive because federal law guarantees them access to health insurance even after sickness rises. With health people, healthy people, Staying out of insurance markets and sick people filing claims insurance premiums would increase substantially. The necessary and proper clause underscore Congress power to ensure that its regulation will com accomplish the objective of expanding, not reducing, access to affordable health insurance. The Supreme Court has erred in NFIB versus Sibelius 2012 when it concluded five versus four that uh, five to four that is the individual mandate in Obamacare was beyond the scope of the necessary and proper clause. See Neil S. Siegel, free riding on benevolence, collective action federalism, and the minimal minimum courage provision. A second way in which the necessary proper clause advances the collective action principle is by allowing Congress to solve collective action problems when other federal powers are unavailable. For example, the question presented in United States vs. Comstock 2010 was whether any clause of Section 8 authorizes Congress to permit the U.S. Attorney General to civilly commit mentally ill, sexually dangerous federal prisoners after they complete the federal sentences if no state will accept custody of them. The court held 7-2-2 that the necessary prop clause confers such authority, relying part on the, part, on the fact that it 
the case implicated implicated a collective action problem involving multiple states. The court in Comstock recognized the NIMBY problem not in my backyard. After the sentence of a sexually dangerous prisoner has expired, the federal government might release him for civil commitment in several possible states. A state, state A, that assumes custody must pay the financial costs associated with his indefinite commitment. Meanwhile, other states potentially benefit from state A's decision to commit individuals who might otherwise move to or through those states upon release, in part because the federal government has severed his ties to state A by imprisoning him for a long time. Instead, if we emphasize that the federal government had helped create the problem and now sought to solve, the court featured the evidence that the states often refused to assume custody, potentially hoping to free right another state's decision to do so. The court stressed that it is a federal statute helped to solve the collective action problem. The discussion so far concerns the federalism components of the Necessary and Proper Clause, its effect on the relationship between the federal government and the states. The third way in which the clause advances the collective action principle is through its separation powers. Components effects on the relationship between Congress and the other branches. The part of the clause that authorizes Congress to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution or other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officers thereof, grants Congress broad authority to structure the executive and judicial branches. Has Congress decided how many cabinet departments uh, would fill the executive branch, how they would be shipped and bounded, how many justices would compose the Supreme Court, and where and when the court would sit. Akil Reed Amar, American's Constitution, a biography. Under the Articles of Confederation, there was no separate executive or judiciary, and the so federal law was largely unenforceable. Under the Constitution, Congress can ensure that federal laws, including solutions to collective action problems, are enforced effectively. The separation powers components confirms and Chief Justice Marshall in McClough v. Maryland, 1819, correctly interpreted the word necessary in the necessary and proper clause to mean convenient or useful, not indispensable. Every creation or reorganization of federal departments throughout American history has to be necessary for carrying out the powers granted to the federal government. Rather than being indispensable, each one was a convenient way of organizing the SEC branch. See Jack M. Belkin, Living Organic Originalism. A federal law is a proper or appropriate. In the language of McClock, if it is consistent with the constitutional test and the structure, federal legislation may not violate individual rights or contravene principles of separation powers or federalism including the collective action principle.